Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Adam Lane Smith, the attachment specialist here. Today, I want to dive deep into the reason that marriages are falling apart so badly in America and in the entire West. I've got an expert with me, Matt Enns. He is of the sovereign man. He specializes in helping repair marriages that are currently falling apart, especially, and I love this piece of your work, Matt, by helping men reclaim their authentic but healthy masculinity. Matt, welcome to the channel. Glad to have you here. Thank you so much, man. Uh, I'm a huge admirer of your work, and so I'm really, really happy to be here. Thank you. We're going to have a great conversation here today. We're going to ruffle some feathers, but it's okay. We're going to come out the other side stronger. Absolutely. So, Matt, I want to dive into this immediately. Why do you think that there is a masculinity crisis happening in just about every industrialized nation in the world? Yeah, when you're looking at the historical causes of these things, you can kind of go back as far as you want and make that the beginning, right? But I would say for what's happening right now, um, most directly, that would be kind of the post-war women getting into the workforce phenomenon. And I think what happened there is we developed this unhealthy idea that men as the leaders of a relationship is purely a result of their ability to provide financially. And so when women were able to provide financially for themselves, we lost the ideal of what a man should be in a relationship because that that thing that we believed incorrectly was the main and only thing that we provided in relationship was no longer necessary from the male half of the relationship. So we lost our identity. And continuing on from there, you got all of the various the various waves of feminism that started with a wonderful ideal of women having equal rights, but then it quickly turned into men and women are equal and the same. And I think that's an enormous loss for the healthy relationship dynamics today because men and women offer very different complementary skills and attributes in a relationship. And the idea that we no longer have that is an enormous loss. So you're in the situation now where men and women no longer have gender roles from the past and tradition to help define their relationship. And so they're in this very unusual place of saying, we're going to design this thing from scratch. And a relationship is far too complex for two people to design from scratch. And sharing everything 50-50, whether it's a relationship partnership, a business partnership, a military partnership, um, it's not normally the most effective way to do things. And I think you combine all of that with um, unhealthy male images on TV. You have the attack from academia with gender theory and with feminist theory. You have the attack from media where basically every male figure on TV is some sort of Homer Simpson. Um, and we no longer have a, a clearly defined ideal of what the healthy masculine is. And so we're floundering. Men died in, in the scores through World War I, through World War II, the Dust Bowl. They checked out through the Great Depression. They, they just burned down to nothing. And there were very few men left to be present. So women stepped up into masculine roles. They had to. There was no safety and stability. But as they did that, they grew resentful that they had to do that, but were being treated as, as they, they were living as men and being treated as women. And that was that separation, which led, it seems like, to the push for equality and then sameness, because then the women said, we're doing everything you're doing already, plus extra. It, it, what I've seen is a lot of women coming into my coaching practice saying, you know, my mom and grandma both told me never trust men. Don't leave it up to men. Focus on your career. That's where we're getting now. Focus on your career. Have a baby when you're 80 years old. It'll be great. And, and, and it's, it's pushing through this sense of safety because men died or burned out or were traumatized or just gone. And women had to step into that role. Now, we're seeing this revitalization of, well, it's really a surge of resentment of women don't want to do that. They don't want to be men. TikTok, the trend on TikTok is I want to be in my feminine energy, but no mm -hmm. man is in his masculine energy. And if he is, he's Andrew Tate. I think that's where we're stuck. But there was a recent Forbes survey that uh, they, they interviewed executive women from major, major global organizations. And they said, how many of you wish that your partner made enough for you to stay home? 84% of them said, I wish that my husband made enough for me to stay at home. 66% mm -hmm. said, I actively resent my husband for not making enough for me to stay at home. Mm -hmm. These were global executive level women, C-suite level, level women, women that we would look at and say, yeah, she's killing it. They want to stay home. So the resentment against being masculine is overwhelming. Do you think that that's playing a big part in this? Yeah, resentment is, is the number one issue that I see in relationships. And it's exactly like you described. She's resentful that he's not stepping up as a man. He's resentful that she's in her masculine and in his mind preventing him from stepping up as a man. And so they're both resenting each other for the same reason and wanting the same thing and yet preventing each other from getting there. And I think part of that goes back to, you know, whether you want to call it third wave, fourth wave feminism, where they 
in my mind, feminism wasn't saying, hey, here's how to be an empowered, strong, capable woman. It was saying you can also be a man. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the trends in women's happiness, et cetera, you can see that for decades, basically uninterrupted women's happiness and fulfillment in life has been going down. And yet the message they're still getting is the number one thing you should be focused on is your career is you know driving ahead, getting accomplishments. And, and yet that doesn't seem to be leading to an increase in fulfillment. And I speak to a lot of women, I, I work with men only, but I speak to a lot of women as well. And they, they feel almost like it's a betrayal of their gender if they decide to focus on their family. They think that they're somehow betraying other women and not doing the thing that they're meant to do because the societal pressure is so enormous. And I think that goes back to grandmothers and mothers who said, I can't trust men. Men have left me. They betrayed me. They cheated on me. They just weren't present. Weak fathers. All of that creates this vacuum at the top that women mm -hmm. have to step into and fulfill. And then they do. And then they don't like it. So they resent it. But then men this lack of masculinity. What I have seen is that masculinity was in its infant form of being reborn from the ashes. I think the eight seventies, eighties, maybe the nineties, right? Men were in the infant state. They were raised mm -hmm. up. Women were masculine. Men were children. Come the, the, the two thousands, men have been emerging into this juvenile teenage mm -hmm. state, right? We've got now, you know, I red pill, we got the pickup artist. We've got, you know, how many Lambos do you own? How many Bugattis do you own? I'm going to sleep with a pile of girls every single night. We've got that hookup culture going strong. And, and it seems like that really is this juvenile, like 15-year-old, 18-year-old male trying to just have fun and expand his horizons and figure out if he's a man or not. That's what it seems to me to be. And now it looks like men are finally emerging onto the stage. A few of us, right? You're, you're mm -hmm. teaching sovereignty for men and mm -hmm. responsibility. I'm teaching sovereignty and responsibility for men through attachment mm -hmm. theory. And, and we are getting there. But it seems like women are terrified and they're having a hard time letting go of the steering wheel because they were burned so bad for so many generations. Is it possible that feminism then is a response to the absence of real masculinity in the world? I think so because... You know, when I'm, when, I'm when I'm working with my clients, I'm always focusing on what are the internal issues that are causing these external problems, right? And if you flip it and look at what women are, how women are viewing men, it always comes from a place where they have an unhealthy understanding of the masculine, right? And this mm -hmm. could be because, because of their father, it could be because of exes that they've had, but they're inherently distrustful of what they perceive as the dangerous masculine. And so mm -hmm. since they don't recognize the healthy masculine, any type of masculinity that shows up is perceived as a threat. And so even if they desperately want that secure masculinity from their husband or from their partner, if it starts to show up, they have a threat response and they do whatever they can to shut it down, which usually means they go into their own masculine so that they can provide themselves that safety that the masculine can provide. But they do that by taking it away, by basically castrating their husbands. And so he's left in the situation where he has no balls and he hates her for it. And she's left in the situation where he has no balls and she hates him for it. It doesn't work for either side. So men are deeply unhappy when they're not stepping into their full mature masculinity, right? I've seen this with my coaching clients who come in. They are miserable. That's where a mm -hmm. lot of depression comes in. I, I think it's where most male depression comes in mm -hmm. is this feeling of powerlessness, feeling like you do not have any control over your life. Masculinity then is the embracing of real sovereignty over self and also the embracing then of, of responsibility for others. But you can't embrace either of those if you feel powerless and masculinity is that power level. So what role do you think masculinity plays in male mental health? I think it's absolutely central. Um, I mean, I think on some level what masculinity is, is the, high, the highest expression of healthy maleness, right? And of course, women can be masculine. Men are also feminine. There's a balance. But um, masculinity in some sense is just a term that we use to describe the highest ideal of the healthy male. And without that, I think men, men tumble into this sense of hopelessness very, very quickly. And unfortunately, a lot of the modalities that are out there to help treat men, they're not male oriented, right? Men are looking for a result and men will cl crawl through broken glass for their family if there is a result at the end of it. But if they go to therapy, they talk about their feelings, they get some validation and then they leave going, well, that felt kind of nice, but what do I do? And masculinity is driven, it's purposeful, it's competing, it's, it's looking to achieve and conquer. And that isn't being fed to us as, a, as an option. We're not being told, hey, what you should do is go do these things, feel powerful, share that sense of protective power with your family. And so you get guys like Andrew Tate who are saying that in an unhealthy way, 
but at least young men are getting some sense of like, hey, it's okay to want to be bigger, better, stronger, faster. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I, from my years of doing psychotherapy as a licensed marriage and family therapist and working with individuals, one thing I saw again and again and again was men who came into me, they'd been to five, six other therapists, 10 years of therapy, and they would say, Adam, I have followed everything every therapist has ever told me. I have never really felt better. Nothing's doing better. I'm about ready to give up. My, my wife is making me come to you one last time. Just, just get this over with, do your assessment and we'll just call it good. And when I would sit down and build them structured plans to reenact real, like re- get real power into their life, to build sovereignty, to solve problems, to end their pain, the light came back in their eyes and it was like they were alive again. And that was what they had been looking for. That was one thing that drove me really into coaching instead of therapy was that I could then get up and, and people would come in for that proactively and say, Adam, build me a plan. And I could say, yes, here is your plan. Let's walk through it together. And now people can do that. And I get to teach on this channel and, and I talk to men like you who are helping men do the same thing. But that is exactly what men are looking for is solutions. Talking mm-hmm. about their feelings is not going to fix the problem. It will make them, give, it'll, it'll bump them up like a sugar high, but it will wear off just as fast as a sugar high and they're going to be just as bad as they were before. I agree with that. You talked about Andrew Tate. You talked about growing awareness. And just to be clear, I'm not against Andrew Tate as a human being. I don't like what he teaches to men, but I think that he's an emerging juvenile masculinity, right? He, he's this representation figure of juvenile masculinity, the power fantasy without full awareness of what masculinity can be. Talk to me a little bit about how you see Tate and the collective unconscious of men. What do you think he's fulfilling there? Yeah, so there's there's this idea in Jungian psychology of the shadow, right? And that's that part of us that we repress, that we think is bad, that we try to ignore and walk away from. And when you do that, it doesn't disappear. It just means it has nobody consciously controlling it and it comes out in even unhealthier ways. Mm-hmm. And the first step towards shadow integration is first becoming aware of that shadow of saying, hey, you know what? I do have some nasty impulses and desires. I can do bad things. I can be violent. I have a tendency towards maliciousness and destruction. And when you're aware of that, you can begin to integrate it in a healthy way. For example, using that tendency towards violence rather than harming innocent people towards protecting innocent people, mm-hmm. right? And I look at Andrew Tate as a bit of like the shadow emerging, shadow masculinity emerging on a societal level. And so on the one hand, you can look at that and say, look at all these bad things he's saying. This is so terrible. And I get that. And a lot of what he says, I think, is despicable. Um, But at the same time, a lot of what he says is wonderful and empowering. And if we can take that this this consciousness of, hey, it's okay to be a man and this message that he spread where people are waking up to the fact that, hey, it's, it's all right to be a man, I can pursue that, and we can integrate the shadow in a healthy way, this kind of mass societal awareness that he's created can now be directed towards something more healthy. So as much as a lot of what he says is detestable, I think his overall impact bringing awareness to this now gives us the opportunity to begin integrating the shadow into something more healthy. Yes, I have seen this time and again when I help people fix their attachment issues, right? Those those suppressed, silent needs become that shadow with nice guys. Mm-hmm. It's I'm going to do nice things for my girlfriend or my wife, and then she'll want to sleep with me. With avoidant men, it's I'm going to love bomb them, and then they won't hurt me, and they'll actually do what I need them to do. It's It's I will do these things for my secret, unspoken needs. Tate represents very much that shadow side, but but the the transparent side of coming out and saying, look, I am not going to be docile anymore. I think that's his biggest message is that men not only shouldn't be docile, but must not be docile. Mm-hmm. I think that he's a call to action to not be housebroken anymore. Mm-hmm. So many men are housebroken children. Well They're emerging into that, that edgelord teen phase of juvenile masculinity. I think that's what he's calling people into. But I think that there's a step beyond that as well that many of us are now becoming aware of. So let's talk a little bit more about modern movements and masculinity that we've both seen. I know you and I have both been on this on the male empowerment circuit or, or the male sphere, manosphere for quite some time. I've been involved for about 12 years now. Um, talk to me about some of the movements you have seen, the good, the bad, the ugly. I'll share some of mine as well. Yeah, there, there's this idea in uh, philosophy from Hegel that you get you know, the thesis, then the antithesis, then the synthesis, mm-hmm. right? And I think we had modern feminism emerged, and then you had the antithesis antithesis of red pill emerged, and now that's created the space for the synthesis of something that's not in between those two, but above them. And mm-hmm. I think that's what guys like you and I and so many others are trying to define in this kind of new landscape that we're in is 
what does a healthy synthesis of both of these things look like? Mm -hmm. Because I think we've talked a little bit about, you know, how modern feminism is creating this depolarized gender dynamic where nobody knows what to do. And both of them are resentful that the other person is not providing what they need. Mm -hmm. um, but there's also a problem on the red pill side where it's basically saying, here's how to hack the female biological algorithm to get what you want in the short term. And to be fair, if you meet a naive woman, it will work in the short term, right? If, mm -hmm. if you want to go pick up a girl at a bar and do that, you know, 400 out of the next 400 days, red pill is pretty effective at doing that. Mm -hmm. But if you want to have a fulfilling connected relationship where both of you end up psychologically healthier at the end of it, um, it's not going to get you there. The only kind of long-term relationship that red pill is going to get you is, you know, living with a broken slave. And if you want to live with a broken slave, try it. I suspect you will not find fulfillment on the other side of it. I love that so much because I have said time and time again, right? Feminism is broken, uh, insecurely attached women who had weak fathers and or bad mothers that destroyed mm -hmm. their ability to believe in love. And then you have that men that they raised modern culture of men who have come out with red pill and, and MGTO, for example, and mm -hmm. red pill specifically is, I know you're anxiously attached from your mom and you tried to earn her approval. So you tried to earn approval from women in the world. They hurt you. Now it's time for you to become avoidantly attached. So you can prey upon anxiously attached women who are mm -hmm. insecure and will do anything for your approval. Here's how to manipulate their worst abandonment fears and control mm -hmm. them. I just saw Richard Cooper the other day posted and said, she needs to know that she is replaceable. And that's emotional coercion. That's fear, right? Dread game. I will make you live in fear so that you will sexually please me. That's mm -hmm. emotional coercion. That, that's, that's not love. That's not real intimacy. And that's going to explode in your face, which is why red pill will just lead you to the same misery that you have experienced so many times in the past. What do you think about leading forward into that, that synthesis into that more mature masculinity? Do you think that that is the answer? I think it's the only answer. And I think, you know, in my coaching practice, I have uh, um, more than a handful of men who have come from the red pill space and um, they had a pretty good time of it early on, right? It was working. They slept with some of the men I've worked with, you know, a thousand women, mm -hmm. right? But then they get to 30, 40, 50 and they go, I'm lonelier than I have ever been. Yes. And although this red pill stuff seems to work initially, I can't hold on to a relationship long term and I'm just tired of this. It's not doing anything for me anymore. What do I do? Mm -hmm. And by the time they come to me, they're almost so broken because they're like, everything that I've done, it worked to get me the things I thought I wanted, but it turns out I want something deeper than that. And these are very, very broken men. And it's unfortunate that for the last little while, and this happens in times of kind of repression of certain ideas that were the only guys who are willing to speak against the overwhelming narrative are kind of the more brash, boorish people, even looking at a character like Martin Luther, um, mm -hmm. the Protestant Reformation, a very boorish individual, right? Mm -hmm. And it's unfortunate that those are the only voices saying, hey, men, we do have advice for you. We do have a plan for you. We do have steps of action oriented towards a particular result, um, but it doesn't work long term. And so you mentioned the idea of like, you know, let her know you have other options. So out of fear, she always stays with you. And, you know, that's, that's the red pill solution. And okay. So what's above that, right? Well, let's, let's first say, what's the opposite of the feminist, the, the, the feminist solution is kind of the opposite of that. She kind of makes him into a bit of this passive slave. And then, you know, she gets to feel that sense of power over him. So it's like, okay, women has power. Woman has power over man. Man has power over woman. What's, what's above that? Like you're saying the clear pill, my, my team's been working on the gold pill. So I think both of those are great, but uh, clear pill is really, it hits it on a lot of levels. I like that. Mm -hmm. um, what's above that? It's like, well, how about you make her feel so damn special and so damn secure in the relationship that she wants nothing more than to make you happy. And most guys have no idea how to do that. I love that. No most guys do don't that. know about the, uh, the bonding hormone oxytocin, how it's, it, it is, it is almost like heroin for women, but it mm -hmm. comes not from fear. In fact, fear blocks it. Right. Mm -hmm. Fear blocks the production and reception of oxytocin stress. When you stress her out, it blocks the reception of a lot of these things. So it diminishes that connection. No wonder she's going to eventually leave you. She's going to form a fear association with you. But when you build a thriving, emotionally intimate relationship with her, with healthy, secure attachment, the oxytocin flows like water and to be crude here for a minute, but to use red term pills, it will make her addicted to you and your love. 
and probably it will make you addicted to her and her love and you'll be bonded together. But oxytocin, when they when they take the, the saliva swabs of couples who've been together for years, happily together and securely attached, the, the amount of oxytocin for both partners is off the charts. That drives a huge female sex drive through the rest of the relationship after that first year, instead of falling off a cliff. Guys don't realize this, but after that first seven months to a year, your dopamine, the novelty of dopamine that, that, you know, oh, I'm having sex with a new girl wears off. Oxytocin drives your erection after that. So through the rest of the relationship, if you're experiencing erectile dysfunction, you're experiencing sex drive issues. Oxytocin is a huge piece of that, typically, for your sex drive to go up and to have the biggest erection of your life until you're, you know, 90 years old. Drive the oxytocin connection. If you want her to be faithful and loyal, you must also be faithful and loyal and drive emotional intimacy on both sides. If it's fake, then you're mm -hmm. love bombing, right? Through avoiding mm -hmm. attachment. It's not going to work. It's going to be temporary. She's going to resent you. She's going to realize that it was fake. It's not going to work, but you have to build that. Talk to me about men that you have seen who learn emotional intimacy and the game changer that that is. Cause I, I know it's a big one. It's incredible um, how lost men are right now. And I have, I'm, I'm consistently so inspired by the men that I talk to because they're in such unbelievable amounts of pain, either because they're pursuing a long-term relationship and they're not getting anything back or because they've been, they've pursued a thousand short-term relationships and they're now dead inside and lost. And they're in so much pain, but they're willing to try whatever they think will work. Like, just tell me what to do. And if it increases my suffering in the short term, that's fine. I just want something that works. And it gets to the point with some men where when I say, hey, here's how to actually interact with a woman healthily. And when she gets upset at you, rather than shutting her down, yelling at her, treating her like the tyrant king so that she gets too afraid to leave, you actually listen to her, let her rant. And from a secure place of masculinity say, hey, if my three-year-old daughter was ranting at me right now and telling me she hated me, I wouldn't feel the need to tell her off and threaten her and make her scared right? But you're so threatened by your partner, your girlfriend, your wife, that you feel like, oh, I don't like this feeling of being threatened by her leaving. I'm going to make her feel more afraid than me. How about you make her feel loved? Are you strong enough when she's going through her female, you know, her hormones, or she's just having an emotional storm of some kind? Are you strong enough to stand there like the lighthouse in the middle of the storm? Let her storm spin your light of love and support and connection. And when she calms down, be there for her to go, wow, that was too much emotion for me to handle. I threw it at my man. He seems to be able to handle it. Well, maybe that means I can lean on him because if you can get through that and you can be calm and you don't get afraid and react because of that, and you just stay in your masculine, by the time she's done storming, she will be so connected to you, so grateful to you, so happy that she has somebody that can handle the things that she internally can't handle. The connection after that is worth all of the storm, even if it's an hour and a half. And you take men through this the first couple of times and it's remarkable how they react. Like, I, I, I can't believe this worked. It, said it went exactly like you said, and she was so kind to me. She, she was sending me heart emojis. She never sends me heart emojis. <laughs> I've got three male clients who are all in their 40s right now who have a long-term partner, and, they're, and I'm training all of them on this. And a lot of guys out there, when they hear you say, be the storm in the lighthouse, let her rage, they're thinking that you're telling them, oh, take on abuse, deal with her a verbal abuse, deal with her crap, be her purse dog, and let her just beat you around. And guys out there, let me tell you, that's not what Matt's saying. That's not what I'm saying. That is not masculinity either. But how does a leader act? Okay. Somebody walks into your office. They're one of your employees. It's your assistant. It's it's somebody, it's your vice president. Someone right below, right, right below your level. And they say, I am so angry. I am so upset. Things are not going fair. The, a leader, a CEO in that case would stop and say, okay, this person's upset because they feel they aren't being heard and they feel like something's not fair. Okay. They don't get threatened. How dare you come in here? You're not the boss of this company. Oh yeah. No, 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 no. That's not what they do, but that's how a lot of men respond. What Matt is saying and what I'm encouraging here is stop and say, they don't think something's fair. If they're angry, anger is never a primary emotion. Anger is always a secondary emotion to, to sadness, hurt, or fear, and then the belief that those will not be taken seriously, so they will make you take it seriously by using anger. It's an innate response. It comes in through attachment issues. It comes in through not being treated fairly in the past. You are going to set a new precedent. You come in, they come in, they're not being treated fairly, they're angry. You start calming them down. You deescalate. Okay, I hear you. I, it sounds like something's not feeling fair. Let's make it feel fair. I want you to feel fulfilled. I want you to understand that you're appreciated. Let's take care of you. That's how you would talk CEO to, you know, VP or whatever. And then if they disrespect you, you tell them that. And you say, this is disrespectful. I want to help you. 
we're going to have this conversation, but you need to take a breath and I need you to have respect for me right now. If they refuse, you don't throw them out the window. You say, you're being very disrespectful. I will no longer have this conversation with you. You need to pause. You need to go cool down. I will talk to you later when you are calmer. I'll expect an apology when that happens. And they calm down. They go away. Hopefully they come back right. If they don't, then you say, okay, I gave you a multiple chances. You're done. You've disrespected me and you're continuing to do so. Doesn't sound like you and I can have a relationship. That's the four level escal or de-escalation process that you should use. Most men don't follow that because they don't know it. They just jump to how dare you question me and they're an angry teenager. And I'm, Matt, I'm sure you've seen that plenty of times. Yeah, and I, I, I found this very interesting dynamic because I work with a lot of guys who suffer from nice guy syndrome, right? And so they think we start our first coaching, um, our first coaching session and it's going to be, here's how to stand up for yourself and set boundaries and be your stronger man and tell her, you know, I'm not going to take this. And what I do is I say, can you be strong enough to take it? Can you just say, can you listen for the underlying emotional reality that she's facing, right? That thing underneath the anger. Can you meet her there? Give her that validation because she needs that validation from you. And when the storm passes, can you say, hey, here's some things you said that I don't agree with and I want to talk to you about those. Mm. Or once she's happy afterwards, are you going to be too afraid to do that? And the fascinating thing is when a lot of these men have been through two, three, four, five of these storms, and since I work with men whose relationships are already falling apart, he's got one foot out the door, she's got one foot out the door. Um, there's plenty of opportunities for these storms to come up and them to practice this. Without me telling them at all how to set boundaries, if they go through three, four, five of those storms and they can look back and say, hey, I didn't storm back. I didn't get defensive. I didn't insult her. I didn't storm away and pout and yell. They all of a sudden, something, something triggers them and then they go, hey, I'm looking back at my behavior and I've been a good man for the last month. I've done everything I'm supposed to do and I'm proud of who I've been. I'm not going to take this from you right now because you just crossed the line and I will not be spoken to that way. And in that state, they do it not from a place of defensiveness, not from a place of fear, from a place of self-respect that they know they are worthy of being treated a certain way. And the funny thing is, I don't coach them on that. I wait for them to explain to me that they've had that moment, which is usually four to six weeks into coaching. And then I say, ah, now we can begin teaching you how to set boundaries in a healthy way because you're emotionally capable of it. Mm -hmm. um, but men don't give themselves that power because by the time they think it's time to lay down the law, they've already embarrassed themselves by losing their cool. They've let the interior feminine take over on the outside. They've started going into their own feminine emotional storm. They're ashamed of it. And from that place, they can't stand up for themselves in a healthy way. But if you teach them how to not react and get defensive and just to be strong enough that, hey, ultimately, if she goes on a storm for 15 minutes about something minor, I can probably take that. A month later, they come back and they've been assertive and they've stood up for themselves and they're excited and they're proud. And then we can begin the coaching on how to be assertive. And I love when they become self-aware that they are giving in to their weaker self and they realize it and say, I don't want to be this anymore. Instead mm -hmm. of just, this is who I am. I can't stop it. Right. There's a word here in the, in the English language. Most people have not heard of before. And it's an amazing word. That's very important. It's effeminate. It is the inappropriate presence of feminine attributes in a man. It, it, it's not, there's, it's not a problem to have feminine energy, right? Masculine no, energy, to. calm, secure, stable, at times able to exude a bit of feminine energy as well, because that's a very different. Uh, but effeminacy, you are effeminate when you give in to your emotions, meaning you are abandoning places where you should be masculine and are instead exuding feminine energy in that moment in the wrong way. Otherwise, masculine energy and, and feminine energy, you need to be secure enough that you can have moments of mm -hmm. feminine energy. Plenty of people would say Adam Lane Smith is a, fe is a more feminine energy kind of person than, than other masculine men because I talk about feelings. Mm -hmm. I, I acknowledge other people. I'm, I'm built on compassion. That's, that's one mm -hmm. of my main three virtues that I, that I follow, right? Feminine energy is not the problem, guys. It's inappropriate feminine energy at times when you need to instead be masculine. And the word for that is effeminate. Guys out there, burn that word into your soul. I am being effeminate. Mm -hmm. That right there, it's, it's on par with dishonorable. I am being dishonorable. Those are words that we don't use anymore, but man, they resonate with men. Absolutely. And one of the ways to think about that is, you know, we all have this balance of masculine and feminine energy, right? And it's hard to quantify. Maybe, maybe in a masculine man, the healthy balance is 90, 10 or 70, 30 or, or 50, 50, whatever it is, mm -hmm. is kind of irrelevant, but mm -hmm. you have to be in touch with that feminine part of yourself. So when the right time comes with your children, for example, with infants at certain times with your wife, you can meet her on that soft, nurturing, empathetic level. Mm 
-hmm. But when men don't develop that part of themselves, what happens is like we we're talking about the shadow earlier, they repress that feminine part of themselves, that softer side of themselves. Mm -hmm. And in moments of heightened emotional intensity, it comes out and it takes over. And that's an effeminate man. That's a man who's been possessed by the unhealthy internal feminine and he's wearing it on the outside. And you can see these guys pouting about their drink at Starbucks when they send it back and they treat the barista rudely, right? Yelling at their wives and making her feel afraid so they can feel less afraid. And when you're really secure in your own masculinity, um, I had a pretty big storm with my wife last night and I had to draw some boundaries and I had to say, hey, mm -hmm. this is not okay. Mm -hmm. But I was able to do it, maybe a little bit of an edge in my voice, but mm -hmm. I certainly didn't lose it like I used to and start storming back at her and go into my feminine and cause mm -hmm. both of us to be in this unhealthy, toxic feminine space mm -hmm. and cause the, the conflict to spiral. It resolved pretty mm -hmm. quickly. We were compassionate and empathetic with each other and we got to a place of connection because she could feel I wasn't threatened mm -hmm. and that helps her calm down so much but as soon as you as the man of the relationship who is supposed to be that place of equanimity of emotional stability of not being effeminate when you can offer that as a gift to your wife then she goes oh, okay maybe this isn't as scary and uncertain as i thought because he's radiating calm confidence right now mm -hmm. maybe i can also calm down but if you snap into your feminine and into your effeminate mode she's gone you're gone nothing gets better well, then she has to be the man and that's the thing that's right men masculinity is about order and structure it's building a structure over others and giving them boundaries so they know they can completely relax within those boundaries and know that everything will be okay no matter what as long as they obey those boundaries you've created everything will be okay and their their stress levels plummet to zero um, among chimpanzee troops the the male mm -hmm. at the top his cortisol levels are highest in the entire troop and everybody else's are like rock bottom levels because his are so high. If his are not, if there's not a male at the top holding that position, everybody else's cortisol levels go sky high because mm -hmm. now they don't have somebody setting the code, the law. They don't know what's right. They don't know what's okay. They don't feel safe. Nobody's protecting them from others or from other predators. They don't know what's happening. The man at the top has sky high stress levels so everybody else can calm down. That's, that's what women have been living with. That's why going back to the beginning of this, that's why women are so resentful when they're thrust into the masculine role because of weak men. That's what we need to fix. So I love that you bring up your wife as an example. I have two daughters of my own. My third daughter is going to be born next month. I have two sons, but just thank you. But just this morning, um, my daughter, my oldest daughter was sitting on my lap and she was complaining that she wasn't getting time with me because my son was sitting with me. And I looked at her and I said, sweetheart, 48 hours ago, you and I got back from a four day trip where it was just the two of us. Do you remember this? It was just the two of us day and night sushi for every meal. She's like five, six years old, that sushi for every meal. Uh, we were at a home fancy hotel. We had all these, these TV shows and movies. We walked around. We did all these events. Do you remember that? Oh yeah. <laughs> I said, and I didn't yell it. I just said, okay. So you remember your brother didn't see me for four days. He now wants to sit with me. Can you give him some space to be able to sit with me and get some of that love that he's been missing? And she said, oh, yeah, okay. And before that, she was almost in tears. Dad, he won't let me sit with you. So I could have yelled and screamed at her, mm -hmm. but I didn't. I just calmly walked her through it. And I said, okay, can he sit with me first? And then I will sit with you. And she said, okay. And then mm -hmm. we did. He sat on my lap boundaries. He sat on my lap. We snuggled. We watched a movie. When he was done, he left. She jumped, jumped right on top of me, just Beautiful. clinging to me like a monkey. And I just, okay, all right, wrapped her up in a blanket and we snuggled and I kept my word. And because mm -hmm. I did that, her trust in me grew, but I built boundaries, did not emotionally react. Everything was fine. That's why her emotions were able to come down. That's, that's the masculine and the feminine. And men need to be doing this for our daughters even more Absolutely. than we do it for our wives, we need to do it for our daughters. And it's incredible how much a calm, confident, non-threatened male presence can calm down an entire house and an extended family. I have, oh, I have one client who was very into red pill for a very long time, you know, one-on-ones with Rolo Tomasi, all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And we did some internal work to help him with his rage issues. And so now he's all of a sudden, you know, he's not reactive to the drama in his family in the same way. And he came back to me, he said, he's like, not only is my relationship better, my extended family, my sister came to me and said, everybody's calmer when you're around. What happened? My girlfriend's family, I haven't even been around them. They are calmer and my girlfriend doesn't understand why. One confident male at the top of the chimpanzee troop who is not emotionally reactive, who's not threatened by every display of emotion from everybody underneath him, brings 
calm and peace and connection to everybody that's even peripherally near him. It's and incredible. I love this. I, I call this the Hammurabi effect is what I call this because in ancient times, right? You had Hammurabi and his code in his city. Anyone who wanted to come live in his city, you had to follow his code. And he inscribed the laws on pillars in multiple languages placed throughout the city. So if you weren't sure what the rules were, okay, I want to live in this city, but what are the rules? What, how am I, am I going to get my head chopped off? Is someone going to kill me in the night? What's going to happen? I'll just go find the code. All right. It's on the pillar and read it in my mm -hmm. language. As long as you follow my code, you are safe in my city, and I will mm -hmm. never deviate from this code. Hammurabi didn't once in a while, you know, once a month. Yeah, I'm kind of tired. I'm going to go out in my city and start stabbing people. He would always follow the code. The code mm -hmm. was everything. So if you wanted to live in his safe, sheltering city, you just followed the code. I, I, I've seen beautiful, beautiful turnaround. Um in the African-American community, for example, mm -hmm. um, which historically has had really a, a big challenge with fatherlessness. And when they when they bring in masculine leaders and pop them into, you know, youth groups or family groups or anything, everybody suddenly is calmer and safer and everybody is achieving and school grades go up and, and, and everything vastly improves just with the presence of a father figure or an authority, a male, a healthy male authority figure who is benevolent and loving. It's incredible what effect you can achieve through, through subcultures, through everything, mm -hmm. just with the presence of a man who is caring and secure. That Hammurabi effect um, is absolutely fantastic. I'm definitely going to be stealing that and teaching that to my <laughs> clients. Um, that's fantastic. And and it to kind of circle that back to earlier in the conversation, um, this kind of gray zone where, we're, where we have no idea what the gender roles are. And when men attempt to say, hey, here's some of the structure our family should abide by, mm -hmm. the female views it as threatening and shuts it down. So there's no code that the family's living by. And one of the things you have to do as a man is say, what is my code? What is the code for my family? Yes. And if you can clearly define that, um, the feminine does love boundaries, right? Because oh, it's yeah. only within a safe, only within the walls around the castle that you can you can experience relaxation inside the castle, right? Correct. And if you create those boundaries, allow her to test you emotionally until she finds them, show her repeatedly, no, no, this really is a boundary, and I'm not going to enforce it as a tyrant and make you afraid and threaten you. I'm going to for enforce it as the wise king who's calm and unthreatened, but stable and secure. When you get those masculine boundaries, when that code is well known by everybody in the house, the feminine can relax and begin to flow inside of that. And that's that what she wants to do. She wants to flow. And if you can give her the safety, even if initially there's some resistance, because the resistance is going to be her finding out where is the boundary and is it real? And if she tests the boundary with you and finds out, oh, there actually are no consequences. It's not a real boundary. She's going to continue to be in this chaotic state of seeking boundaries and testing and going like this. But if she finds the boundaries, then she can flow inside of them. And that's when she and relaxes she, into her feminine. If you fail the tests, she has to be the man and she has to treat you like a child. And if she'll you hate you for the it. tests, she, most women, in my experience, oh, the vast majority of women start to respond very positively when mm -hmm. a man steps up and lives internally his code. That's because right. unless she has a personality disorder, she is almost certainly going to step up. The research is fun on this. The research shows that when a man converts to a new religion, truly converts to a new religion 97 percent of the time his wife converts to that new religion with him as well my wife and i we experienced this event six years ago we ended up converting i i had a full conversion i said i've got to do this and i took it to my wife and i said look i i have to do this and she was <gasps> no we can't do that's horrible and then i i had to say all right you're gonna have to trust me i'm gonna walk through this you don't have to follow me but i'm gonna show you my transformations i go through it and you decide if this is what you want and we walked through that together and boy, she's more insanely religious now than I am about that. She is fanatical. Funny. I have to almost hold her back. It's she took to it so strongly because she saw that change in me and she trusted me that she could go into it and explore it and then grow it, it, guys. It, and it's not just religion. It's, it's the feminine masculine dynamic. Again, remember 84%. By Forbes magazine, 84% mm -hmm. of C-suite executive women want to stay at home and have their partner be able to financially take care of business. 84% of the top career women, power to girls, they want to stay home. So guys, it's not that they don't want to accept it. It's that they, like Matt said earlier, they don't have a positive view of masculinity. They don't understand what a healthy man is. I had a woman ask me just this week, Adam, what does a healthy man look like? I, I don't know how to trust one because I've never seen one. And I had to model that for her and show her mm -hmm. that. 
They don't know what a healthy masculine man is. They don't believe they'll be treated fairly. Mm -hmm. So they believe they have to guard their own walls against you. Those are the three pieces. So you take those in reverse. You show her she doesn't have to guard her walls against you. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you model that healthy masculinity and you show her that you are going to be fair with her and you're going to be just. She can trust a just king to lead her and care for her as long as you tr you listen and you're fair and you're always just. When you follow the Hammurabi effect, women follow you. It's incredible. And a lot of men get this wrong because they think that, okay, I'm going to set a boundary and if she respects me, then she's going to immediately comply and do whatever I say. <laughs> right? And your laugh is yeah. exactly appropriate. Yeah. Right? And so the process of setting a healthy boundary in a family isn't saying this is now the law and everybody's going to immediately follow it. Right. Mm -hmm. Setting the boundary is the prelude to chapter one of a very long book. Mm -hmm. Right. Because the first thing that she's going to do when you set a boundary is she's going to emotionally test if this is real. She's going to push back on it. She's going to reject it. She's going to argue with it. And you can interpret that as she doesn't respect me as a man. Or you can interpret that as she's testing if I'm a man. And if she tests it and she finds, hey, when I push past this, there actually is something that happens and I don't really like it, but it seems fair and it's reasonable and he's not losing his shit on me. He's being calm, but he's being assertive and he's being firm. Then she goes, okay, this boundary actually seems real. I've emotionally tested it. There were consequences, but they were fair and loving. This actually makes me feel safe. Okay, now for her at that point, it becomes a boundary, right? So don't expect that she's going to be some compliant broken slave to you because you mentioned something arbitrarily that you don't even follow yourself. You have to show her to your point through your own actions. Hey, look at the way that I live my life. I do the things I say I'm going to do. I follow the rules that I expect everybody else to follow. You can follow my example and see that I mean it. And when you push against it, I'm not threatened. I accept that. I talk you through it. I work with you. I want to hear why you like it, why you don't like it. But that emotional testing is it's real. That's mm -hmm. what a boundary represents for her. It's not a verbally expressed thing. It's an emotionally tested thing. And when she finds that it's true, she will soften and flow inside of that boundary. And funny enough, she might even act relieved when she finds out that it's a real boundary. Matt, we've danced around, right? A new masculinity, clear pill, gold pill. We've talked about Hammurabi. We've talked about all of this. And we've, we've both said, yes, we think there's something coming next. Tell me first what you think the masculine revival is going to look like. And then I'll tell you what I think it's going to look like. And we'll, we'll, then we'll, we'll put some money down on it. And then in 10 years, we'll, we'll pay off our bet. But what do you think is going to come next for masculinity? And how do you think the world's going to respond to it? I think the first thing's going to, that's coming and it's happening already is that we're going to once again recognize men and women are different. We have different hormonal systems, emotional systems. We react differently to stress. We're very, very different creatures. And red pill has kind of opened the door to public consciousness saying, yes, there are differences, but how can we do that in a healthy way? Right? I think the second thing that's going to come is we're going to return again to some traditional idea of gender norms. Now it's not going to be a return to the 1950s because no. I don't think that was a healthy gender dynamic. No. Correct. That was, I was unhealthy in the opposite direction, Correct. but we're going to say tradition does provide us some guidance. Now we're not going to choose the decade of the 1950s, but we're going to say cumulatively looking at historical societies, what of that seems to be relatively functional and healthy. And let's use that as a framework and then adapt it to our individual relationship. Because again, designing a relationship from scratch is way too complex a task for two people. You have to have some kind of structure and then adapt it for what works for each of you to authentically sp express yourself in the relationship. So I think that's going to be an enormous part of the conversation. And I think there's also going to be an element of men coming back into their confidence and saying, it's okay to be a man because I don't see very much of that. I mostly see unhealthy people saying it's okay to be a man and they're teaching young men how to be a man in an unhealthy way. And I think with the emergence of massively, massively popular figures, Jordan Peterson, Joe Rogan, Jocko, et cetera, there is this emerging consciousness that, hey, there are healthy role models of, of men beyond Homer Simpson, beyond the abusive men we see on TV, beyond the passive men who are bumbling fools on TV. There are actually ideals that we can pursue. And I think we're going we're gonna to come a long way in defining what that ideal is over the next five or 10 years. And then in the decades after, it's really going to start to ripple down into relationships. And we're going to see this reemergence of something that's partly historical and partly modern 
that works in the modern context, but still recognizes men and women are different. I love this. I, I think that things are going to get a little bit worse before they get better. I think they're going to have to, to try to, uh, you know, there's a lot of very afraid women and there's a lot of bad men. And I think mm -hmm. that those two, those two groups together are holding back a male revival, fearful women and bad men. Mm -hmm. And I think that things will have to get worse under the leadership of bad men. And then fearful women will say, who is going to help? Who can we trust? And as, as men step forward, right. And, and talk and have this conversation, I'm sure this conversation right here, ladies, if you're watching this drop down in the comments and say, I'm glad you men are doing this because that's why we need to step mm -hmm. forward. I get those comments from women all the time. I'm glad there's a man who's sharing about responsibility, intimacy, connection, truth, justice, right? Women are mm -hmm. thrilled when they hear men talk like this. I think that as we do this, as you teach your men, as I teach my men, as we, we move forward and make more connections, I think that people are gradually going to see as things get worse over here for people who reject it, but things get better over here for people who follow it. It's, it's going to be a sharp divide between people who have no healthy flow between the masculine and the feminine mm -hmm. and people who do have a healthy flow between masculine and feminine. Say it another way. The future belongs to the people who show up. I'm on my fifth child. I mean, the future belongs to people like me, to be just to be honest with you. Um, doesn't mean you have to have kids to have a, a shape on the future, but it's it's a big piece of it, you guys. Mm -hmm. And to raise healthy children who make it into adulthood, who then have their own healthy children, to create that healthy dynamic, you've got to be a healthy man. Otherwise, you're just launching broken people out into this world, and they are going to, to dead end in, in a number of bad ways that you can't even say on social media anymore. You'll get banned. So... I think that it's going to get worse. Then people are going to say, we need men. We need men. And as men step forward, people are going to say, thank God you're here. It's going to be just like a burning building. What happens in a burning building? Nobody thinks they need a fireman. And then somebody knocks something over and it catches on fire. And then they think they can still control it. So then they try to put it out themselves. And eventually it gets so awful that they remember, wait. There's people who do this and can do and can help when I can't. So they run outside, they call a fireman and they wait for the fireman to arrive and the firemen come in. They, they rescue anybody inside. They put out the fire and you take all these pictures of the firemen carrying, you know, smoke covered children out outside. Um, that's masculinity. And I think that's what's going to happen. And then what they don't show afterward is those firemen comforting the children, the children saying, I want to be like this fireman. The family saying, thank goodness you were here. And then everybody being more grateful for those firemen. And then creates a new generation of firemen, right? That's what I think is going to happen here in the West. And I, I believe that with all of my heart. I think the world will come to terms with it because it's what we need more than anything else. I think you're absolutely right. And it's really unfortunate that we are probably going to need some kind of um, increased tur turmoil before we get there, right? Whether it's increased economic stripe strife, famine, war, like who knows what it'll be, but something will happen as things continue to devolve, where all of a sudden men are going to start coming along and doing the things that they're meant to do. And now we're going to go from having very few ideals of the healthy masculine to seeing them everywhere. And that's going to cause an enormous shift. And I would say to every, all the men watching, don't wait for that. Because the more healthy men that we have before that happens, the better we are. And on top of that, even in your own relationship, don't wait for her to change. If you want to be the masculine leader, which so many men that I talk to want to, including all the the um, MGTOW, you call them, MG, the men going their mm -hmm. own way, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I try to be a leader, but she won't let me. Mm -hmm. It's like, that's not what leadership is. And right. what I've seen in countless relationships that I work with, if you start showing up as the man that you're meant to be, she will magically and mysteriously become the woman that you want her to be. She oh, is goodness. desperate for you to show up in that way. And she will not need coaching. She will not need to read self-help, self-development books. She will get there very quickly because in the presence of the healthy masculine, she can revert back to the person that she always wanted to be on a deep down level. And she can meet you with that emotional connection, that appreciation, that respect, that love that she desperately wants to share with you. But it's up to you to create that framework because if you're waiting for her, you're probably going to keep waiting. Matt, we've talked a lot about what positive masculinity does for women. <laughs> We've talked a lot about it, right? And the women in the audience, they're pumped, they're cheering. But a lot of men out there are probably saying, 
why should I have to step forward when the world has kicked me, when the world has spit on me, when the world says I'm not needed, when we've got people like Kathleen Kennedy out here saying the future is female, when we've got people in media saying men need to step aside, it's not your turn anymore, when we've got people saying, I, I've even heard feminists in the UK saying men should be rounded up and their numbers should be reduced so that we don't have them on this planet anymore, so that we women can control things and make it better, right? I've heard feminists calling for this over in the UK. Mm -hmm. Men right now are probably listening to this saying, why should I do all of this work, take this crap, pass these tests, work my butt off and do all of this and have high cortisol levels at the top so that she can be happy after a lifetime of women treating me like garbage. Give me your answer, what you think this does for men, then I will pitch in as well. You should do that because it's your duty. And one of the defining characteristics of being a man is that you do things that are right and honorable in spite of how you feel, right? Men and women have a different relationship to truth in a relation in, in relationship. And men tend to analyze the facts and then determine how they should feel. Women tend to analyze how they're feeling in a relationship and then determine which facts matter, right? Which is why she's in a disconnected state. The fact that you left the dish out one time means she can only see all the other times you've left out the dishes. That's the only fact that matters to her in that emotional state. Right. But men, and thank God we do this, we have a tremendous capacity for violence and we're the bigger, stronger sex. And so if we're led by our feelings, the world gets to be a very dangerous place very quickly. We have to sublimate our feelings to our opinions of what is right and wrong and do our duty irrespective of how we're feeling. And right now the world needs men. And so whether you don't feel like it, whether you figure it's unfair is in my opinion, basically irrelevant. The world needs you at your very best, at your strongest, most compassionate, most loving. And so you need to begin showing up that way based on need and based on duty, not based on how you feel. And to that, I will add this. Men should step into their full, mature masculinity because we are biologically designed to feel so damn good when we step into it. All the brain chemicals that come when you step forward and take leadership, when you take ownership of self, whether it's the vasopressin bonds that release into your brain when you work with other people to solve problems, whether it's the serotonin, just ridiculous serotonin dump that you get doing projects, focusing in, making achievements, whether it's the oxytocin bond that you finally get when you can settle down and be calm and at peace, that femininity gives to you this huge oxytocin flow. That's why they snuggle up to you and want to comfort you and love you, whether it's the GABA, gamma amino biuric acid that releases into your brain and, and softens you in that moment. It decreases your stress level. It makes you more resilient against that cortisol. Yes, your, your cortisol levels are high, but you also have an alternate chemical in there that's suppressing it so you don't feel that cortisol level being that high. It's an incredible experience, but then you are proud of yourself. You take honor and pride in yourself and say, I am a man that I am proud of. I have a family. I have love. I have wild sex every night with a wife who adores me. I have kids who are thriving. I have a business that I uh, that is making a good impact on the world instead of working a job I hate. I am responsible for people that are under me and I am feeding their families and I love it. I have power and I use it like a benevolent king. I feel like a billion dollars walking. When a man has that level of masculinity, that is what he feels. So this isn't just guys go out and throw yourself into a meat grinder for other people. Yes, it is duty. Yes, we are designed for it. Yes, your people, the people out there are waiting for you to do this. But it feels so good when you step into your secure masculine self and be the man you are designed by nature to be. Do not be afraid that you will be miserable forever. You will be miserable forever until you do this. And then you will feel phenomenal. And let me just completely agree with that. Because as somebody who's been on both sides of that and lived a very different way the first 30 years of my life, I wish everybody got to experience one day of how it feels when you can look back in your life and be like, I am providing. I am good. I am loving. My wife does adore me and clings to me when she hugs me. And when I get home, my kids run to me and tell me their problems and are excited to see me. The way that that feels is incomparable to getting easy sex, to not showing up because no one's giving me what I should you know, be receiving in terms of affection. No one's giving the respect I deserve. So I'm just going to hide from that. The other side of that, I wish everybody gets to feel that for one day in their life, because to your point, 
biologically, that's what we're meant to do. And when you do it, your system turns on and there is no feeling like it in the whole world. Every guy out there, listen to this. Do not be afraid. You are your own answer. Your masculinity lives within you. It's emerging from you. You may be a child form. You might be a juvenile form. You're becoming the mature adult form. We're right there with you. Every man on this planet is making that journey right now, and we're going to lead to something brand new. It's going to be beautiful. Matt, people are going to want to look you up. They're going to learn more about you. Please tell the people at home a little bit about what they can find and where they can find it. Talk to us about you. So we're pretty new to social media. Um, so at the underscore sovereign underscore man on Instagram is the best place to find us, but we are rolling out other platforms soon. For look, So look for that as well. What can they find there? They're going to find a combination of insights into how to be the healthy masculine in relationship, which includes a lot of ex explanations of why she reacts the way she does and why you feel that way when she does. Um, but also simple tips, tips and tricks for how to show up as a man, including um, how to find your purpose, how to find a career that's fulfilling, how to get disciplined, et cetera, because that's all very much part of being the healthy masculine. And you guys know I am Adam Lane Smith, the attachment specialist. I'm on just about every single platform is Adam Lane Smith. I'm on Instagram as at attachment Adam. You're on YouTube as at attachment Adam. I'm on everywhere. Look for Adam Lane Smith and you'll find me. My website is adamlanesmith.com where I have private coaching. I have a course. I have a community. I have books. I have everything. If you have never felt loved or purposeful in your entire life. And if you are overwhelmed by loneliness and you think there's something holding you back, there is, and I will show you how to fix that. Get in touch and I'll help you. Matt, thank you so much for joining me today. I look forward to the next conversation. I had an absolute blast. This is really enriching and rewarding. So thank you very much for having me.